section thirty six of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli anecdotes of prince henry the son of james the first when a child prince henry the son of james the first whose premature death was lamented by the people as well as by poets and historians unquestionably would have proved an heroic and military character had he ascended the throne the whole face of our history might have been changed the days of agincourt and crecy had been revived and henry the ninth had rivalled henry the fifth it is remarkable that prince henry resembled that monarch in his features as ben jonson has truly recorded though in a complimentary verse and as we may see by his picture among the ancient english ones at dulwich college merlin in a mask by jonson addresses prince henry yet rests that other thunderbolt of war harry the fifth to whom in face you are so like as fate would have you so in worth a youth who perished in his eighteenth year has furnished the subject of a volume which even the deficient animation of its writer has not deprived of attraction if the juvenile age of prince henry has proved such a theme for our admiration we may be curious to learn what this extraordinary youth was even at an earlier period authentic anecdotes of children are rare a child has seldom a biographer by his side we have indeed been recently treated with anecdotes of children in the practical education of the literary family of the edgeworths but we may presume that as mr edgeworth delighted in pieces of curious machinery in his house these automatic infants poets and metaphysicians of whom afterwards we have heard no more seem to have resembled other automata moving without any native impulse prince henry at a very early age not exceeding five years evinced a thoughtfulness of character extraordinary in a child something in the formation of this early character may be attributed to the countess of mar this lady had been the nurse of james i and to her care the king entrusted the prince she is described in a manuscript of the times as an ancient virtuous and severe lady who was the prince's governess from his cradle at the age of five years the prince was consigned to his tutor mr afterwards sir adam newton a man of learning and capacity whom the prince at length chose for his secretary the severity of the old countess and the strict discipline of his tutor were not received without affection and reverence although not at times without a shrewd excuse or a turn of pleasantry which latter faculty the princely boy seems to have possessed in a very high degree the prince early attracted the attention and excited the hopes of those who were about his person a manuscript narrative has been preserved which was written by one who tells us that he was an attendant upon the prince's person since he was under the age of three years having always diligently observed his disposition behaviour and speeches it was at the earnest desire of lord and lady lumley that the writer of these anecdotes drew up this relation the manuscript is without date but as lord lumley died in april sixteen o nine and leaving no heir his library was then purchased for the prince henry could not have reached his fifteenth year this manuscript was evidently composed earlier so that the latest anecdotes could not have occurred beyond his thirteenth or fourteenth year a time of life when few children can furnish a curious miscellany about themselves the writer set down every little circumstance he considered worth noticing as it occurred i shall attempt a sort of arrangement of the most interesting to show by an unity of the facts the characteristic touches of the mind and dispositions of the princely boy prince henry in his childhood rarely wept and endured pain without a groan when a boy wrestled with him in earnest and through him he was not seen to whine or weep at the hurt his sense of justice was early for when his playmate the little earl of mar ill-treated one of his pages henry reproved his puerile friend 
i love you because you are my lord's son and my cousin but if you be not better conditioned i will love such an one better naming the child that had complained of him the first time he went to the town of stirling to meet the king observing without the gate of the town a stack of corn it fancifully struck him with the shape of the top he used to play with and the child exclaimed that's a good top why do you not then play with it he was answered set you it up for me and i will play with it this is just the fancy which we might expect in a lively child with a shrewdness in the retort above its years his martial character was perpetually discovering itself when asked what instrument he liked best he answered a trumpet we are told that none could dance with more grace but that he never delighted in dancing while he performed his heroical exercises with pride and delight more particularly when before the king the constable of castile and other ambassadors he was instructed by his master to handle and toss the pike to march and hold himself in an affected style of stateliness according to the martinets of those days but he soon rejected such petty and artificial fashions yet to show that this dislike arose from no want of skill in a trifling accomplishment he would sometimes resume it only to laugh at it and instantly return to his own natural demeanour on one of these occasions one of these martinets observing that they could never be good soldiers unless they always kept true order and measure in marching what then must they do cried henry when they wade through a swift running water in all things freedom of action from his own native impulse he preferred to the settled rules of his teachers and when his physician told him that he rode too fast he replied must i ride by rules of physic when he was eating cold capon in cold weather the physician told him that that was not meat for the weather you may see doctor said henry that my cook is no astronomer and when the same physician observing him eat cold and hot meat together protested against it i cannot mind that now said the royal boy facetiously though they should have run at tilt together in my belly his national affections were strong when one reported to henry that the king of france had said that his bastard as well as the bastard of normandy might conquer england the princely boy exclaimed i'll to cuffs with him if he go about any such means there was a dish of jelly before the prince in the form of a crown with three lilies and a kind of buffoon whom the prince used to banter said to the prince that that dish was worth a crown ay exclaimed the future english hero i would i had that crown it would be a great dish rejoined the buffoon how can that be rejoined the prince since you value it but a crown when james i asked him whether he loved englishmen or frenchmen better he replied englishmen because he was of kindred to more noble persons of england than of france and when the king inquired whether he loved the english or the germans better he replied the english on which the king observing that his mother was a german the prince replied sir you have the white thereof a northern speech adds the writer which is as much as to say you are the cause thereof born in scotland and heir to the crown of england at a time when the mutual jealousies of the two nations were running so high the boy often had occasion to express the unity of affection which was really in his heart being questioned by a nobleman whether after his father he had rather be king of england or scotland he asked which of them was best being answered that it was england then said the scottish-born prince would i have both and once in reading this verse in virgil trostariusui mihi nullo discrimine agitur the boy said he would make use of that verse for himself with a slight alteration thus anglis scatus way mihi nullo discrimine agitur he was careful to keep alive the same feeling in another part of the british dominions and the young prince appears to have been regarded with great affection by the welsh for when once the prince asked a gentleman at what mark he should shoot the courtier pointed with levity at a welshman who was present will you see then said the princely boy how i will shoot at welshmen turning his back from him the prince shot his arrow in the air when a welshman who had taken a large carouse 
in the fullness of his heart and his head said in the presence of the king that the prince should have forty thousand welshmen to wait upon him against any king in christendom the king not a little jealous hastily inquired to do what the little prince turned away the momentary alarm by his facetiousness to cut off the heads of forty thousand leeks his bold and martial character was discoverable in minute circumstances like these eating in the king's presence a dish of milk the king asked him why he ate so much child's meat sir it is also man's meat henry replied and immediately after having fed heartily on a partridge the king observed that that meat would make him a coward according to the prevalent notions of the age respecting diet to which the young prince replied though it be but a cowardly fowl it shall not make me a coward once taking strawberries with two spoons when one might have sufficed our infant mars gaily exclaimed the one i use as a rapier and the other as a dagger adam newton appears to have filled his office as preceptor with no servility to the capricious fancies of the princely boy desirous however of cherishing the generous spirit and playful humour of henry his tutor encouraged a freedom of jesting with him which appears to have been carried at times to a degree of momentary irritability on the side of the tutor by the keen humour of the boy while the royal pupil held his master in equal reverence and affection the gaiety of his temper sometimes twitched the equability or the gravity of the preceptor when newton wishing to set an example to the prince in heroic exercises one day practised the pike and tossing it with such little skill as to have failed in the attempt the young prince telling him of his failure newton obviously lost his temper observing that to find fault was an evil humour master i take the humour of you it becomes not a prince observed newton then retorted the young prince doth it worse become a prince's master some of these harmless bickerings are amusing when his tutor playing at shuffleboard with the prince blamed him for changing so often and taking up a piece threw it on the board and missed his aim the prince smilingly exclaimed well thrown master on which the tutor a little vexed said he would not strive with a prince at shuffleboard henry observed yet you gownsmen should be best at such exercises which are not meet for men who are more stirring the tutor a little irritated said i am meet for whipping of boys you vaunt then retorted the prince that which a ploughman or cart driver can do better than you i can do more said the tutor for i can govern foolish children on which the prince who in his respect for his tutor did not care to carry the jest farther rose from the table and in a low voice to those near him said he had need be a wise man that could do that newton was sometimes severe in his chastisement for when the prince was playing at golf and having warned his tutor who was standing by in conversation that he was going to strike the ball and having lifted up the golf club some one observing beware sir that you hit not mr newton the prince drew back the club but smilingly observed had i done so i had but paid my debts at another time when he was amusing himself with the sports of a child his tutor wishing to draw him to more manly exercises amongst other things said to him in good humour god send you a wise wife that she may govern you and me said the prince the tutor observed that he had one of his own the prince replied but mine if i have one would govern your wife and by that means would govern both you and me henry at this early age excelled in a quickness of reply combined with reflection which marks the precocity of his intellect his tutor having laid a wager with the prince that he could not refrain from standing with his back to the fire and seeing him forget himself once or twice standing in that posture the tutor said sir the wager is won you have failed twice master replied henry st peter's cock crew thrice a musician having played a voluntary in his presence was requested to play the same again i could not for the kingdom of spain said the musician for this were harder than for a preacher to repeat word by word a sermon that he had not learned by rote a clergyman standing by observed that he thought a preacher might do that perhaps rejoined the young prince 
for a bishopric the natural facetiousness of his temper appears frequently in the good humour with which the little prince was accustomed to treat his domestics he had two of opposite characters who were frequently set by the ears for the sake of the sport the one murray nicknamed the tailor loved his liquor and the other was a stout trencherman the king desired the prince to put an end to these broils and to make the men agree and that the agreement should be written and subscribed by both then said the prince must the drunken tailor subscribe it with chalk for he cannot write his name and then i will make them agree upon this condition that the trencherman shall go into the cellar and drink with will murray and will murray shall make a great wallet for the trencherman to carry his victuals in one of his servants having cut the prince's finger and sucked out the blood with his mouth that it might heal the more easily the young prince who expressed no displeasure at the accident said to him pleasantly if which god forbid my father myself and the rest of his kindred should fail you might claim the crown for you have now in you the blood royal our little prince once resolved on a hearty game of play and for this purpose only admitted his young gentlemen and excluded the men it happened that an old servant not aware of the injunction entered the apartment on which the prince told him he might play too and when the prince was asked why he admitted this old man rather than the other men he rejoined because he had a right to be of their number for senex bis puer nor was henry susceptible of gross flattery for when once he wore white shoes and one said that he longed to kiss his foot the prince said to the fawning courtier sir i am not the pope the other replied that he would not kiss the pope's foot except it were to bite off his great toe the prince gravely rejoined at rome you would be glad to kiss his foot and forget the rest it was then the mode when the king or the prince travelled to sleep with their suite at the houses of the nobility and the loyalty and zeal of the host were usually displayed in the reception given to the royal guest it happened that in one of these excursions the prince's servants complained that they had been obliged to go to bed supperless through the pinching parsimony of the house which the little prince at the time of hearing seemed to take no great notice of the next morning the lady of the house coming to pay her respects to him she found him turning over a volume that had many pictures in it one of which was a painting of a company sitting at a banquet this he showed her i invite you madam to a feast to what feast she asked to this feast said the boy what would your highness give me but a painted feast fixing his eye on her he said no better madam is found in this house there was a delicacy and greatness of spirit in this ingenious reprimand far excelling the wit of a child according to this anecdote writer it appears that james i probably did not delight in the martial dispositions of his son whose habits and opinions were in all respects forming themselves opposite to his own tranquil and literary character the writer says that his majesty with the tokens of love to him would sometimes interlace sharp speeches and other demonstrations of fatherly severity henry who however lived though he died early to become a patron of ingenious men and a lover of genius was himself at least as much enamoured of the pike as of the pen the king to rouse him to study told him that if he did not apply more diligently to his book his brother duke charles who seemed already attached to study would prove more able for government and for the cabinet and that himself would be only fit for field exercises and military affairs to his father the little prince made no reply but when his tutor one day reminded him of what his father had said to stimulate our young prince to literary diligence henry asked whether he thought his brother would prove so good a scholar his tutor replied that he was likely to prove so then rejoined our little prince will i make charles archbishop of canterbury our henry was devoutly pious and rigid in never permitting before him any licentious language or manners it is well known that james i had a habit of swearing expletives in conversation which in truth only expressed the warmth of his feelings 
but in that age when puritanism had already possessed half the nation an oath was considered as nothing short of blasphemy henry once made a keen allusion to this verbal frailty of his father's for when he was told that some hawks were to be sent to him but it was thought that the king would intercept some of them he replied he may do as he pleases for he shall not be put to the oath for the matter the king once asking him what were the best verses he had learned in the first book of virgil henry answered these rex erat aeneas nobis quo justior alter nec pietate fuit nec bella major et armis such are a few of the puerile anecdotes of a prince who died in early youth gleaned from a contemporary manuscript by an eye and ear witness they are trifles but trifles consecrated by his name they are genuine and the philosopher knows how to value the indications of a great and heroic character there are among them some which may occasion an inattentive reader to forget that they are all the speeches and the actions of a child End of section thirty six section thirty seven of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the diary of a master of the ceremonies of court etiquette few are acquainted with the mysteries and still fewer have lost themselves in its labyrinth of forms whence its origin perhaps from those grave and courtly italians who in their petty pompous courts made the whole business of their effeminate days consist in punctilios and wanting realities to keep themselves alive affected the mere shadows of life and action in a world of these mockeries of state it suited well the genius of a people who boasted of elementary works to teach how affronts were to be given and how to be taken and who had some reason to pride themselves in producing the cortegiano of castiglione and the galateo of della casa they carried this refining temper into the most trivial circumstances when a court was to be the theatre and monarchs and their representatives the actors precedents and other honorary discriminations established the useful distinctions of ranks and of individuals but their minuter court forms subtilized by italian conceits with an erudition of precedence and a logic of nice distinctions imparted a mock dignity of science to the solemn fopperies of a master of the ceremonies who exhausted all the faculties of his soul on the equiponderance of the first place of inferior degree with the last of a superior who turned into a political contest the placing of a chair and a stool made a reception at the stairs head or at the door raise a clash between two rival nations a visit out of time require a negotiation of three months or an awkward invitation produce a sudden fit of sickness while many a rising antagonist in the formidable shapes of ambassadors were ready to dispatch a courier to their courts for the omission or neglect of a single punctilio the pride of nations in pacific times has only these means to maintain their jealousy of power yet should not the people be grateful to the sovereign who confines his campaigns to his drawing-room whose field-marshal is a tripping master of the ceremonies whose stratagems are only to save the inviolability of court etiquette and whose battles of peace are only for precedence when the earls of holland and carlisle our ambassadors extraordinary to the court of france in sixteen twenty four were at paris to treat of the marriage of charles with henrietta and to join in a league against spain before they showed their propositions they were desirous of ascertaining in what manner cardinal richelieu would receive them the marquis of villa Clare was employed in this negotiation which appeared at least as important as the marriage and the league 
he brought for answer that the cardinal would receive them as he did the ambassadors of the emperor and the king of spain that he could not give them the right hand in his own house because he never honoured in this way those ambassadors but that in reconducting them out of his room he would go farther than he was accustomed to do provided that they would permit him to cover this unusual proceeding with a pretext that the others might not draw any consequences from it in their favour our ambassadors did not disapprove of this expedient but they begged time to receive the instructions of his majesty as this would create a considerable delay they proposed another which would set at rest for the moment the punctilio they observed that if the cardinal would feign himself sick they would go to see him on which the cardinal immediately went to bed and an interview so important to both nations took place and articles of great difficulty were discussed by the cardinal's bedside when the nuncio spada would have made the cardinal jealous of the pretensions of the english ambassadors and reproached him with yielding his precedence to them the cardinal denied this i never go before them it is true but likewise i never accompany them i wait for them only in the chamber of audience either seated in the most honourable place or standing till the table is ready i am always the first to speak and the first to be seated and besides i have never chosen to return their visit which has made the earl of carlisle so outrageous such was the ludicrous gravity of those court etiquettes or punctilios combined with political consequences of which i am now to exhibit a picture when james i ascended the throne of his united kingdoms and promised himself in the world long halcyon days of peace foreign princes and a long train of ambassadors from every european power resorted to the english court the pacific monarch in emulation of an office which already existed in the courts of europe created that of master of the ceremonies after the mode of france observes roger coke this was now found necessary to preserve the state and allay the perpetual jealousies of the representatives of their sovereigns the first officer was sir louis lucknor with an assistant sir john finette who at length succeeded him under charles i and seems to have been more amply blessed with the genius of the place his soul doted on the honour of the office and in that age of peace and of ceremony we may be astonished at the subtlety of his inventive shifts and contrivances in quieting that school of angry and rigid boys whom he had under his care the ambassadors of europe sir john finette like a man of genius in office and living too in an age of diaries has not resisted the pleasant labour of perpetuating his own narrative footnote i give the title of this rare volume finetti flexensis some choice observations of sir john finette knight and master of the ceremonies to the two last kings touching the reception and precedence the treatment and audience the punctilios and contests of foreign ambassadors in england legati legant mungum sixteen fifty six this very curious diary was published after the author's death by his friend james howell the well-known writer and oldest whose literary curiosity scarcely anything in our domestic literature has escaped has analysed the volume with his accustomed care he mentions that there was a manuscript in being more full than the one published of which i have not been able to learn farther british librarian page one sixty three end of footnote he has told every circumstance with a chronological exactitude which passed in his province as master of the ceremonies and when we consider that he was a busy actor amidst the whole diplomatic corps we shall not be surprised by discovering in this small volume of great curiosity a vein of secret and authentic history it throws a new light on many important events in which the historians of the times are deficient who had not the knowledge of this assiduous observer but my present purpose is not to treat sir john with all the ceremonious punctilios of which he was himself the arbiter nor to quote him on grave subjects which future historians may well do this volume contains the rupture of a morning and the peacemakings of an evening sometimes it tells of a clash between the savoy and florence ambassadors for precedence now of questions betwixt the imperial and venetian ambassadors concerning titles and visits how they were to address one another and who was to pay the first visit 
then the frenchman takes exceptions about placing this historian of the levy now records that the french ambassador gets ground of the spanish but soon after so eventful were these drawing-room politics that a day of festival has passed away in suspense while a privy council has been hastily summoned to inquire why the french ambassador had a defluxion of rheum in his teeth besides a fit of the ague although he hoped to be present at the same festival next year or being invited to a masque declared his stomach would not agree with cold meats thereby pointing shrewdly observed sir john at the invitation and presence of the spanish ambassador who at the mask the christmas before had appeared in the first place sometimes we discover our master of the ceremonies disentangling himself and the lord chamberlain from the most provoking perplexities by a clever and civil lie thus it happened when the muscovite ambassador would not yield precedence to the french nor spaniard on this occasion sir john at his wit's end contrived an obscure situation in which the russ imagined he was highly honoured as there he enjoyed a full sight of the king's face though he could see nothing of the entertainment itself while the other ambassadors were so kind as not to take exception not caring about the russian from the remoteness of his country and the little interest that court then had in europe but sir john displayed even a bolder invention when the muscovite at his reception at whitehall complained that only one lord was in waiting at the stairs head while no one had met him in the courtyard sir john assured him that in england it was considered a greater honour to be received by one lord than by two sir john discovered all his acumen in the solemn investigation of which was the upper end of the table arguments and inferences were deduced from precedents quoted but as precedents sometimes look contrary ways this affair might still have remained sub judici had not sir john oracularly pronounced that in spite of the chimneys in england where the best man sits is that end of the table sir john indeed would often take the most enlarged view of things as when the spanish ambassador after hunting with the king at theobald's dined with his majesty in the privy chamber his son don antonio dined in the council chamber with some of the king's attendants don antonio seated himself on a stool at the end of the table one of the gentlemen ushers took exception at this being he said irregular and unusual that place being ever wont to be reserved empty for state in a word no person in the world was ever to sit on that stool but sir john holding a conference before he chose to disturb the spanish grandee finally determined that this was the superstition of a gentleman usher and it was therefore neglected thus sir john could at a critical moment exert a more liberal spirit and risk an empty stool against a little ease and quiet which were no common occurrences with that martyr of state a master of ceremonies but sir john to me he is so entertaining a personage that i do not care to get rid of him had to overcome difficulties which stretched his fine genius on tenterhooks once rarely did the like unlucky accident happen to the wary master of the ceremonies did sir john exceed the civility of his instructions or rather his half instructions being sent to invite the dutch ambassador and the state's commissioners then a young and new government to the ceremonies of st george's day they inquired whether they should have the same respect paid to them as other ambassadors the bland sir john out of the milkiness of his blood said he doubted it not as soon however as he returned to the lord chamberlain he discovered that he had been sought for up and down to stop the invitation the lord chamberlain said sir john had exceeded his commission if he had invited the dutchman to stand in the closet of the queen's side because the spanish ambassador would never endure them so near him where there was but a thin wainscot board between and a window which might be opened sir john said gently he had done no otherwise than he had been desired which however the lord chamberlain in part denied cautious and civil and i was not so unmannerly as to contest against supple but uneasy this affair ended miserably for the poor dutchmen those new republicans were then regarded with the most jealous contempt by all the ambassadors and were just venturing on their first dancing steps to move among crowned heads 
the dutch now resolved not to be present declaring they had just received an urgent invitation from the earl of exeter to dine at wimbledon a piece of supercherie to save appearances probably the happy contrivance of the combined geniuses of the lord chamberlain and the master of the ceremonies i will now exhibit some curious details from these archives of fantastical state and paint a courtly world where politics and civility seem to have been at perpetual variance when the palatine arrived in england to marry elizabeth the only daughter of james the first the feasting and jollity of the court were interrupted by the discontent of the archduke's ambassador of which these were the material points sir john waited on him to honour with his presence the solemnity on the second or third days either to dinner or supper or both the archduke's ambassador paused with a troubled countenance inquiring whether the spanish ambassador was invited i answered answerable to my instructions in case of such demand that he was sick and could not be there he was yesterday quoth he so well as that the offer might have very well been made him and perhaps accepted to this sir john replied that the french and venetian ambassadors holding between them one course of correspondence and the spanish and the archduke's another their invitations had been usually joint this the archduke's ambassador denied and affirmed that they had been separately invited to masks etc but he had never that france had always yielded precedence to the archduke's predecessors when they were but dukes of burgundy of which he was ready to produce ancient proofs and that venice was a mean republic a sort of burghers and a handful of territory compared to his monarchical sovereign and to all this he added that the venetian bragged of the frequent favours he had received sir john returns in great distress to the lord chamberlain and his majesty a solemn declaration is drawn up in which james i most gravely laments that the archduke's ambassador has taken this offence but his majesty offers these most cogent arguments in his own favour that the venetian had announced to his majesty that his republic had ordered his men new liveries on the occasion an honour he adds not usual with princes the spanish ambassador not finding himself well for the first day because by the way he did not care to dispute precedence with the frenchman his majesty conceiving that the solemnity of the marriage being one continued act through divers days it admitted neither prius nor posterius and then james proves too much by boldly asserting that the last day should be taken for the greatest day as in other cases for instance in that of christmas where twelfth day the last day is held as the greatest but the french and venetian ambassadors so envied by the spanish and the archdukes were themselves not less chary and crustily fastidious the insolent frenchman first attempted to take precedence of the prince of wales and the venetians stood upon this point that they should sit on chairs though the prince had but a stool and particularly that the carver should not stand before him but adds sir john neither of them prevailed in their reasonless pretences nor was it peaceable even at the nuptial dinner which closed with the following catastrophe of etiquette sir john having ushered among the countesses the lady of the french ambassador he left her to the ranging of the lord chamberlain who ordered she should be placed at the table next beneath the countesses and above the baronesses but lo the viscountess of effingham standing to her woman's right and possessed already of her proper place as she called it would not remove lower so held the hand of the ambassadress till after dinner when the french ambassador informed of the difference in opposition called out for his wife's coach with great trouble the french lady was persuaded to stay the countess of kildare and the viscountess of haddington making no scruple of yielding their places sir john unbending his gravity facetiously adds the lady of effingham in the interim forbearing with rather too much than little stomach both her supper and her company this spoilt child of quality tugging at the french ambassadress to keep her down mortified to be seated at the side of the frenchwoman that day frowning and frowned on and going supperless to bed past the wedding day of the palatine and princess elizabeth like a cross girl on a form 
one of the most subtle of these men of punctilio and the most troublesome was the venetian ambassador for it was his particular aptitude to find fault and pick out jealousies among all the others of his body on the marriage of the earl of somerset the venetian was invited to the mask but not the dinner as last year the reverse had occurred the frenchman who drew always with the venetian at this moment chose to act by himself on the watch of precedence jealous of the spaniard newly arrived when invited he inquired if the spanish ambassador was to be there and humbly beseeched his majesty to be excused from indisposition we shall now see sir john put into the most lively action by the subtle venetian i was scarcely back at court with the french ambassador's answer when i was told that a gentleman from the venetian ambassador had been to seek me who having at last found me said that his lord desired me that if ever i would do him favour i would take the pains to come to him instantly i winding the cause to be some new buzz gotten into his brain from some intelligence he had from the french of that morning's proceeding excused my present coming that i might take further instructions from the lord chamberlain wherewith as soon as i was sufficiently armed i went to the venetian but the venetian would not confer with sir john though he sent for him in such a hurry except in presence of his own secretary then the venetian desired sir john to repeat the words of his own invitation and those also of his own answer which poor sir john actually did for he adds i yielded but not without discovering my insatisfaction to be so peremptorily pressed on as if he had meant to trip me the venetian having thus compelled sir john to con over both invitation and answer gravely complimented him on his correctness to a tittle yet still was the venetian not in less trouble and now he confessed that the king had given a formal invitation to the french ambassador and not to him this was a new stage in this important negotiation it tried all the diplomatic sagacity of sir john to extract a discovery and which was that the frenchman had indeed conveyed the intelligence secretly to the venetian sir john now acknowledged that he had suspected as much when he received the message and not to be taken by surprise he had come prepared with a long apology ending for peace sake with the same formal invitation for the venetian now the venetian insisted again that sir john should deliver the invitation in the same precise words as it had been given to the frenchman sir john with his never-failing courtly docility performed it to a syllable whether both parties during all these proceedings could avoid moving a risible muscle at one another our grave authority records not the venetian's final answer seemed now perfectly satisfactory declaring he would not excuse his absence as the frenchman had on the most frivolous pretence and farther he expressed his high satisfaction with last year's substantial testimony of the royal favour in the public honours conferred on him and regretted that the quiet of his majesty should be so frequently disturbed by these punctilios about invitations which so often overthronged his guests at the feast sir john now imagined that all was happily concluded and was retiring with the sweetness of a dove and the quietness of a mouse to fly to the lord chamberlain when behold the venetian would not relinquish his hold but turned on him with the reading of another scruple et hinc illi lacrimae asking whether the archduke's ambassador was also invited poor sir john to keep himself clear from categorical asseverations declared he could not resolve him then the venetian observed sir john was dissembling and he hoped and imagined that sir john had in his instructions that he was first to have gone to him the venetian and on his return to the archduke's ambassador matters now threatened to be as irreconcilable as ever for it seems the venetian was standing on the point of precedency with the archduke's ambassador the political sir john wishing to gratify the venetian at no expense adds he thought it ill manners to mar a belief of an ambassador's making and so allowed him to think that he had been invited before the archduke's ambassador 
this venetian proved himself to be to the great torment of sir john a stupendous genius in his own way ever on the watch to be treated al paro di teste coronate equal with crowned heads and when at a tilt refused being placed among the ambassador of savoy and the states-general etc while the spanish and french ambassadors were seated alone on the opposite side the venetian declared that this would be a diminution of his quality the first place of an inferior degree being ever held worse than the last of a superior this refined observation delighted sir john who dignifies it as an axiom yet afterwards came to doubt it with a said de hoc quire query this if it be true in politics it is not so in common sense according to the proverbs of both nations for the honest english declares that better be the head of the yeomanry than the tail of the gentry while the subtle italian has it a meglio esser testa di lucio che coda di sorione better be the head of a pike than the tail of a sturgeon but before we quit sir john let us hear him in his own words reasoning with fine critical tact which he undoubtedly possessed on right and left hands but reasoning with infinite modesty as well as genius hear this sage of punctilios this philosopher of courtesies the axiom before delivered by the venetian ambassador was judged upon discourse i had with some of understanding to be of value in a distinct company but might be otherwise in a joint assembly and then sir john like a philosophical historian explores some great public event as at the conclusion of the peace at vervin the only part of the peace he cared about the french and spanish meeting contended for precedence who should sit at the right hand of the pope's legate an expedient was found of sending into france for the pope's nuncio residing there who seated at the right hand of the said legate the legate himself sitting at the table's end the french ambassador being offered the choice of the next place he took that at the legate's left hand leaving the second at the right hand to the spanish who taking it persuaded himself to have the better of it said de hoc quire how modestly yet how shrewdly insinuated so much if not too much of the diary of a master of the ceremonies where the important personages strangely contrast with the frivolity and foppery of their actions by this work it appears that all foreign ambassadors were entirely entertained for their diet lodgings coaches with all their train at the cost of the english monarch and on their departure received customary presents of considerable value from one thousand to five thousand ounces of gilt plate and in more cases than one the meanest complaints were made by the ambassadors about short allowances that the foreign ambassadors in return made presents to the masters of the ceremonies from thirty to fifty pieces or in plate or jewels and some so grudgingly that sir john finette often vents his indignation and commemorates the indignity as thus on one of the spanish ambassadors extraordinary waiting at deal for three days sir john expecting the wind with the patience of an hungry entertainment from a close-handed ambassador as his present to me at his parting from dover being but an old gilt livery pot that had lost his fellow not worth above twelve pounds accompanied with two pair of spanish gloves to make it almost thirteen to my shame and his when he left this scurvy ambassador extraordinary to his fate aboard the ship he exults that the cross winds held him in the downs almost a seven night before they would blow him over from this mode of receiving ambassadors two inconveniences resulted their perpetual jars of punctilio and their singular intrigues to obtain precedence which so completely harassed the patience of the most pacific sovereign that james was compelled to make great alterations in his domestic comforts and was perpetually embroiled in the most ridiculous contests at length charles i perceived the great charge of these embassies ordinary and extraordinary often on frivolous pretences and with an empty treasury and an uncomplying parliament he grew less anxious for such ruinous honours charles i had however adopted them and long preserved the stateliness of his court with foreign powers as appears by these extracts from manuscript letters of the time mr meade writes to 
sir m stuteville july twenty five sixteen twenty nine his majesty was wont to answer the french ambassador in his own language now he speaks in english and by an interpreter and so doth sir thomas edmonds to the french king contrary to the ancient custom so that although of late we have not equalled them in arms yet now we shall equal them in ceremonies october thirty one sixteen twenty eight this day fortnight the state's ambassador going to visit my lord treasurer about some business whereas his lordship was wont always to bring them but to the stairs head he then after a great deal of courteous resistance on the ambassador's part attended him through the hall and courtyard even to the very boot of his coach sloan manuscripts four one seven eight in the footnote he gave notice to foreign ambassadors that he should not any more defray their diet nor provide coaches for them etc this frugal purpose cost sir john many altercations who seems to view it as the glory of the british monarch being on the wane the unsettled state of charles was appearing in sixteen thirty six by the querulous narrative of the master of the ceremonies the etiquettes of the court were disturbed by the erratic course of its great star and the master of the ceremonies was reduced to keep blank letters to superscribe and address to any nobleman who was to be found from the absence of the great officers of state on this occasion the ambassador of the duke of mantua who had long desired his parting audience when the king objected to the unfitness of the place he was then in replied that if it were under a tree it should be to him as a palace yet although we smile at this science of etiquette and these rigid forms of ceremony when they were altogether discarded a great statesman lamented them and found the inconvenience and mischief in the political consequences which followed their neglect charles the second who was no admirer of these regulated formalities of court etiquette seems to have broken up the pomp and pride of the former master of the ceremonies and the grave and great chancellor of human nature as warburton calls clarendon censured and felt all the inconveniences of this open intercourse of an ambassador with the king thus he observed in the case of the spanish ambassador who he writes took the advantage of the license of the court where no rules or formalities were yet established and to which the king himself was not enough inclined but all doors opened to all persons which the ambassador finding he made himself a domestic came to the king at all hours and spake to him when and as long as he would without any ceremony or desiring an audience according to the old custom but came into the bedchamber while the king was dressing himself and mingled in all discourses with the same freedom he would use in his own and from this never heard of license introduced by the french and the spaniard at this time without any dislike in the king though not permitted in any court in christendom many inconveniences and mischiefs broke in which could never after be shut out End of section thirty seven section thirty eight of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli diaries moral historical and critical we converse with the absent by letters and with ourselves by diaries but vanity is more gratified by dedicating its time to the little labours which have a chance of immediate notice and may circulate from hand to hand than by the honester pages of a volume reserved only for solitary contemplation or to be a future relic of ourselves when we shall no more hear of ourselves marcus antoninus's celebrated work entitled tan eis eutan of the things which concern himself would be a good definition of the use and purpose of a diary shaftesbury calls a diary a fault book intended for self-correction and a colonel harwood in the reign of charles the first kept a diary which in the spirit of the times he entitled slips infirmities and passages of providence such a diary is a moral instrument should the writer exercise it on himself and on all around him 
men then wrote folios concerning themselves and it sometimes happened as proved by many which i have examined in manuscript that often writing in retirement they would write when they had nothing to write diaries must be out of date in a lounging age although i have myself known several who have continued the practice with pleasure and utility footnote the diary of william rakes esq has only recently been published it relates to the first half of the present century and proves that the race of diarists are not extinct among ourselves End of footnote one of our old writers quaintly observes that the ancients used to take their stomach pill of self-examination every night some used little books or tablets which they tied at their girdles in which they kept a memorial of what they did against their night reckoning we know that titus the delight of mankind as he has been called kept a diary of all his actions and when at night he found upon examination that he had performed nothing memorable he would exclaim amici diem perdidimus friends we have lost a day among our own countrymen in times more favourable for a concentrated mind than in this age of scattered thoughts and of the fragments of genius the custom long prevailed and we their posterity are still reaping the benefit of their lonely hours and diurnal records it is always pleasing to recollect the name of alfred and we have deeply to regret the loss of a manual which this monarch so strict a manager of his time yet found leisure to pursue it would have interested us much more even than his translations which have come down to us alfred carried in his bosom memorandum leaves in which he made collections from his studies and took so much pleasure in the frequent examination of this journal that he called it his handbook because says spellman day and night he ever had it in hand with him this manual as my learned friend mr turner in his elaborate and philosophical life of alfred has shown by some curious extracts from malmesbury was the repository of his own occasional literary reflections an association of ideas connects two other of our illustrious princes with alfred prince henry the son of james i our english marcellus who was wept by all the muses and mourned by all the brave in britain devoted a great portion of his time to literary intercourse and the finest geniuses of the age addressed their works to him and wrote several at the prince's suggestion dollington in the preface to his curious aphorisms civil and military has described prince henry's domestic life myself says he the unablest of many in that academy for so was his family had this especial employment for his proper use which he pleased favourably to entertain and often to read over the diary of edward the sixth written with his own hand conveys a notion of that precocity of intellect in that early educated prince which would not suffer his infirm health to relax in his royal duties this prince was solemnly struck with the feeling that he was not seated on a throne to be a trifler or a sensualist and this simplicity of mind is very remarkable in the entries of his diary where on one occasion to remind himself of the causes of his secret proffer of friendship to aid the emperor of germany with men against the turk and to keep it at present secret from the french court the young monarch inserts this was done on intent to get some friends the reasonings be in my desk so zealous was he to have before him a state of public affairs that often in the middle of the month he recalls to mind passages which he had omitted in the beginning what was done every day of moment he retired into his study to set down even james the second wrote with his own hand the daily occurrences of his times his reflections and conjectures adversity had schooled him into reflection and softened into humanity a spirit of bigotry and it is something in his favour that after his abdication he collected his thoughts and mortified himself by the penance of a diary could a clive or a cromwell have composed one neither of these men could suffer solitude and darkness they started at their casual recollections 
what would they have done had memory marshalled their crimes and arranged them in the terrors of chronology when the national character retained more originality and individuality than our monotonous habits now admit our later ancestors displayed a love of application which was a source of happiness quite lost to us till the middle of the last century they were as great economists of their time as of their estates and life with them was not one hurried yet tedious festival living more within themselves more separated they were therefore more original in their prejudices their principles and in the constitution of their minds they resided more on their estates and the metropolis was usually resigned to the men of trade in their royal exchange and the preferment hunters among the back stairs at whitehall lord clarendon tells us in his life that his grandfather in james the first's time had never been in london after the death of elizabeth though he lived thirty years afterwards and his wife to whom he had been married forty years had never once visited the metropolis on this fact he makes a curious observation the wisdom and frugality of that time being such that few gentlemen made journeys to london or any other expensive journey but upon important business and their wives never by which providence they enjoyed and improved their estates in the country and kept good hospitality in their house brought up their children well and were beloved by their neighbours this will appear a very coarse homespun happiness and these must seem very gross virtues to our artificial feelings yet this assuredly created a national character made a patriot of every country gentleman and finally produced in the civil war some of the most sublime and original characters that ever acted a great part on the theatre of human life this was the age of diaries the head of almost every family formed one ridiculous people may have written ridiculous diaries as elias ashmole's but many of our greatest characters in public life have left such monuments of their diurnal labours footnote ashmole noted every trifle even to the paring of his nails and being as believer in astrology and a student in the occult sciences occasionally mentions his own superstitious observances thus april eleventh sixteen eighty one he notes i took early in the morning a good dose of elixir and hung three spiders about my neck and they drove my ague away deo gratias End of footnote these diaries were a substitute to every thinking man for our newspapers magazines and annual registers but those who imagine that these are a substitute for the scenical and dramatic life of the diary of a man of genius like swift who wrote one or even of a lively observer who lived amidst the scenes he describes as horace walpole's letters to sir horace mann which form a regular diary only show that they are better acquainted with the more ephemeral and equivocal labours there is a curious passage in a letter of sir thomas bodley recommending to sir francis bacon then a young man on his travels the mode by which he should make his life profitable to his country and his friends his expressions are remarkable let all these riches be treasured up not only in your memory where time may lessen your stock but rather in good writings and books of account which will keep them safe for your use hereafter by these good writings and books of account he describes the diaries of a student and an observer these good writings will preserve what wear out in the memory and these books of account render to a man an account of himself to himself it was this solitary reflection and industry which assuredly contributed so largely to form the gigantic minds of the seldons the camdens the cokes and others of that vigorous age of genius when coke fell into disgrace and retired into private life the discarded statesman did not pull himself into a lethargy but on the contrary seemed almost to rejoice that an opportunity was at length afforded him of indulging in studies more congenial to his feelings then he found leisure not only to revise his former writings which were thirty volumes written with his own hand but what most pleased him he was enabled to write a manual which he called wade Makem, 
and which contained a retrospective view of his life since he noted in that volume the most remarkable occurrences which happened to him it is not probable that such a manuscript could have been destroyed but by accident and it might perhaps yet be recovered the interest of the public was the business of camden's life observes bishop gibson and indeed this was the character of the men of that age camden kept a diary of all occurrences in the reign of james i not that at his advanced age and with his infirm health he could ever imagine that he should make use of these materials but he did this inspired by the love of truth and of that labour which delights in preparing its materials for posterity bishop gibson has made an important observation on the nature of such a diary which cannot be too often repeated to those who have the opportunities of forming one and for them i transcribe it were this practised by persons of learning and curiosity who have opportunities of seeing into the public affairs of a kingdom the short hints and strictures of this kind would often set things in a truer light than regular histories a student of this class was sir simon's dues an independent country gentleman to whose zeal we owe the valuable journals of parliament in elizabeth's reign and who has left in manuscript a voluminous diary from which may be drawn some curious matters footnote this diary has been published since the above was written in the footnote in the preface to his journals he has presented a noble picture of his literary reveries and the intended productions of his pen they will animate the youthful student and show the active genius of the gentlemen of that day the present diarist observes having now finished these volumes i have already entered upon other and greater labours conceiving myself not to be born for myself alone qui vivat sibi solus homo nequiat esse beatus malo mori nam sic vivere nolo mihi he then gives a list of his intended historical works and adds these i have proposed to myself to labour in besides divers others smaller works like him that shoots at the sun not in hopes to reach it but to shoot as high as possibly his strength art or skill will permit so though i know it impossible to finish all these during my short and uncertain life having already entered into the thirtieth year of my age and having many unavoidable cares of an estate and family yet if i can finish a little in each kind it may hereafter stir up some able judges to add an end to the whole sic mihi contingent vivere sicque mori richard baxter whose facility and diligence it is said produced one hundred and forty-five distinct works wrote as he himself says in the crowd of all my other employments assuredly the one which may excite astonishment is his voluminous autobiography forming a folio of more than seven hundred closely printed pages a history which takes a considerable compass from sixteen fifteen to sixteen eighty four whose writer pries into the very seed of events and whose personal knowledge of the leading actors of his times throws a perpetual interest over his lengthened pages yet this was not written with a view of publication by himself he still continued this work till time and strength wore out the hand that could no longer hold the pen and left it to the judgment of others whether it should be given to the world these were private persons it may excite our surprise to discover that our statesmen and others engaged in active public life occupied themselves with the same habitual attention to what was passing around them in the form of diaries or their own memoirs or in forming collections for future times with no possible view but for posthumous utility they seem to have been inspired by the most genuine passion of patriotism and an awful love of posterity what motive less powerful could induce many noblemen and gentlemen to transcribe volumes to transmit to posterity authentic narratives which would not even admit of contemporary notice either because the facts were then well known to all or of so secret a nature as to render them dangerous to be communicated to their own times they sought neither fame nor interest 
for many collections of this nature have come down to us without even the names of the scribes which have been usually discovered by accidental circumstances it may be said that this toil was the pleasure of idle men the idlers then were of a distinct race from our own there is scarcely a person of reputation among them who has not left such laborious records of himself i intend drawing up a list of such diaries and memoirs which derive their importance from diarists themselves even the women of this time partook of the same thoughtful dispositions it appears that the duchess of york wife to james the second and the daughter of clarendon drew up a narrative of his life the celebrated duchess of newcastle has formed a dignified biography of her husband lady fanshawe's memoirs have been recently published and mrs hutchinson's memoirs of her colonel have delighted every curious reader whitelock's memorials is a diary full of important public matters and the noble editor the earl of anglesey observes that our author not only served the state in several stations both at home and in foreign countries but likewise conversed with books and made himself a large provision from his studies and contemplation like that noble roman portius cato as described by nepos he was all along so much in business one would not imagine he ever had leisure for books yet who considers his studies might believe he had been always shut up with his friend selden and the dust of action never fallen on his gown when whitelock was sent on an embassy to sweden he journalized it it amounts to two bulky quartos extremely curious he has even left us a history of england yet all is not told of whitelock and we have deeply to regret the loss or at least the concealment of a work addressed to his family which apparently would be still more interesting as exhibiting his domestic habits and feelings and affording a model for those in public life who had the spirit to imitate such greatness of mind of which we have not many examples whitelock had drawn up a great work which he entitled remembrances of the labours of whitelock in the annals of his life for the instruction of his children to dr morton the editor of whitelock's journal of the swedish embassy we owe the notice of this work and i shall transcribe his dignified feelings in regretting the want of these manuscripts such a work and by such a father is become the inheritance of every child whose abilities and station in life may at any time hereafter call upon him to deliberate for his country and for his family and person as parts of the great whole and i confess myself to be one of those who lament the suppression of that branch of the annals which relates to the author himself in his private capacity they would have afforded great pleasure as well as instruction to the world in their entire form the first volume containing the first twenty years of his life may one day see the light but the greatest part has hitherto escaped my inquiries this is all we know of a work of equal moral and philosophical curiosity the preface however to these remembrances has been fortunately preserved and it is an extraordinary production in this it appears that whitelock himself owed the first idea of his own work to one left by his father which existed in the family and to which he repeatedly refers his children he says the memory and worth of your deceased grandfather deserves all honour and imitation both from you and me his liber familicus his own story written by himself will be left to you and was an encouragement and precedent to this larger work here is a family picture quite new to us the heads of the house are its historians and these records of the heart were animated by examples and precepts drawn from their own bosoms and as whitelock feelingly expresses it all is recommended to the perusal and intended for the instruction of my own house and almost in every page you will find a dedication to you my dear children the habit of laborious studies and a zealous attention to the history of his own times produced the register and chronicle of bishop kennett containing matters of fact delivered in the words of the most authentic papers and records all daily entered and commented on 
it includes an account of all pamphlets as they appeared this history more valuable to us than to his own contemporaries occupied two large folios of which only one has been printed a zealous labour which could only have been carried on from a motive of pure patriotism it is however but a small part of the diligence of the bishop since his own manuscripts form a small library of themselves the malignant vengeance of prynne in exposing the diary of laud to the public eye lost all its purpose for nothing appeared more favourable to laud than this exposition of his private diary we forget the harshness in the personal manners of laud himself and sympathize even with his errors when we turn over the simple leaves of this diary which obviously was not intended for any purpose but for his own private eye and collected meditations footnote it is a thin book simply lapped in parchment and filled with brief memorandums written in a remarkably neat and minute hand End of footnote. there his whole heart is laid open his errors are not concealed and the purity of his intentions is established laud who too haughtily blended the prime minister with the archbishop still from conscientious motives in the hurry of public duties and in the pomp of public honours could steal aside into solitude to account to god and himself for every day and the evil thereof the diary of henry earl of clarendon who inherited the industry of his father has partly escaped destruction it presents us with a picture of the manners of the age from whence says bishop douglas we may learn that at the close of the last century a man of the first quality made it his constant practice to pass his time without shaking his arm at a gaming-table associating with jockeys at newmarket or murdering time by a constant round of giddy dissipation if not of criminal indulgence diaries were not uncommon in the last age lord anglesey who made so great a figure in the reign of charles the second left one behind him and one said to have been written by the duke of shrewsbury still exists but the most admirable example is lord clarendon's history of his own life or rather of the court and every event and person passing before him in this moving scene he copies nature with freedom and has exquisitely touched the individual character there that great statesman opens the most concealed transactions and traces the views of the most opposite dispositions and though engaged when in exile in furthering the royal intercourse with the loyalists and when on the restoration conducting the difficult affairs of a great nation a careless monarch and a dissipated court yet besides his immortal history of the civil wars the chancellor of human nature passed his life in habitual reflection and his pen in daily employment such was the admirable industry of our later ancestors their diaries and their memoirs are its monuments james the second is an illustrious instance of the admirable industry of our ancestors with his own hand this prince wrote down the chief occurrences of his times and often his instant reflections and conjectures perhaps no sovereign prince said macpherson has been known to have left behind him better materials for history we at length possess a considerable portion of his diary which is that of a man of business and of honest intentions containing many remarkable facts which had otherwise escaped from our historians the literary man has formed diaries purely of his studies and the practice may be called journalizing the mind in a summary of studies and a register of loose hints and sposos that sometimes happily occur and like ringel burgess that enthusiast for study whose animated exhortations to young students have been aptly compared to the sound of a trumpet in the field of battle marked down every night before going to sleep what had been done during the studious day of this class of diaries gibbon has given us an illustrious model and there is an unpublished quarto of the late barre robert a young student of genius devoted to curious researches which deserves to meet the public eye footnote this has also been published in a handsome quarto volume since the above was written roberta's collection of anglo-gallic coins are now in the british museum End of footnote. i should like to see a little book published with this title 
atium delitosum in quo abjecta well in actione well in lectione well in visione ad singulus dies anni sixteen twenty nine observata representantur this writer was a german who boldly published for the course of one year whatever he read or had seen every day in that year as an experiment if honestly performed this might be curious to the philosophical observer but to write down everything may end in something like nothing a great poetical contemporary of our own country does not think that even dreams should pass away unnoticed and he calls this register his nocturnals his dreams are assuredly poetical as lauds who journalized his seem to have been made up of the affairs of state and religion the personages are his patrons his enemies and others his dreams are scenical and dramatic works of this nature are not designed for the public eye they are domestic annals to be guarded in the little archives of a family they are offerings cast before our larries pleasing when youth is long expired to trace the forms our pencil or our pen designed such was our youthful air and shape and face such the soft image of our youthful mind shenstone End of section 38